I never wanted to fight. But if I must fight, I will do it well. Bait and tackle? Time to lot them up! You picked the wrong fight. Let's mix things up a little, shall we? You're going to help me save the world. Y'all may want to start running. Hello and welcome back to another game review. My name is Saiken and today we're going to take a good look at Lamblighter's League, which is a freshly released Paradox game uh, that features a 1920 adventurous environment uh, where we are joining a crew of Lamblighters that help uh, the infamous Mr. Locke to fight against the Banished League. Uh, in a race against time to reach a source of unlimited power, a tower of unknown proportion. So that's the story of the game. And today we're going to review is the game any good? Before we jump into that, a quick reminder, I am reviewing games in a little bit more strict way than others would potentially do. I don't appreciate modern reviews where everything gets an eight, nine or 10 out of 10. Um, a average uh, game gets a 5 out of uh, 10, a good game gets a 6 to 7 out of 10, an exceptionally good game gets an 8 out of 10, uh, a once in a year or once in a decade type of game gets a 9 out of 10 and the genre defining game that is truly standing the test of time gets a 10 out of 10. So that's how I look into it. We're going to systematically look whether or not a Lamplighter's League is worth it. And if you are interested in the game after the review, feel free to check out one of the codes that I do have in the doobly-doo below. That'll give you a discount in acquiring it. Thanks and let's go right into the review. So let's start with the first category, lore and background of the game. Lamplighter's League, as I mentioned, is featuring a story plot in the 1920s where a group of daredevils is helping Mr. Locke to go on to missions. The way that uh, that is uh, going is each of the characters essentially has it, uh, their own set of skills and you can mix and match them in order to go on to different missions. The world is nicely animated and gives you a uh, overview of different missions that you can do at the time. Each of the agents uh, themselves do have their own set of skills, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, we will review that in a second. So in terms of lore and background of the game, the game uh, does a good job in animating and bringing the lore alive. Overall, the game is uh, good and well structured in presenting the story. You are getting uh, a glimpse into what is happening in the world bit by bit. All of the dialogues are uh, fully voiced. You can always go and uh, take a bit more of a conversation. Um, I disabled sound here, but all of them are fully voiced as well. Within each of the missions, you get uh, snippets of lore uh, that you can read at your leisure. And there is also a, a good storytelling mechanic. Now, um, I would uh, overall uh, give the game in a lore perspective a solid 6 out of 10. It does a good job, but not an exceptional job. So what's missing on the lore perspective? If you are looking at a Lamplighter's League compared to other games, the story itself could uh, benefit from more cutscenes. Other games, Diablo as an example, or even XCOM, are frequently using cutscenes in order to introduce and keep the tensions. Really good uh, cinematic cutscenes are expensive, and I do understand uh, the game development has been cutting corners here and was just focusing on the bare narrative. But even if you do it that way, you could tell a bit more of an engaging story. Overall, my perception of Lamplighter's League was that the storytelling uh, was rather slow. You're getting spoon-fed a couple of uh, bi uh, pieces of information, um, which helps to kind of um, con con uh, cons preserve the narrative of a fun 
and exciting game, but other games like Darkest Dungeon simply did it better with less effort. The narrator was more on point, the story was darker and more engaging. In Lamplighter's League it sometimes feels, besides uh, here and there plot holes, that uh, the story is just one of uh, why do we have extraordinary uh, heroes and adventurers that can wield magic-like abilities. Let's find kind of a reason for that and place it into an era where no action game has yet or no tactical uh, game has yet placed. So for me, the fundamental buildup of the story is a bit flawed. The uh, narrative pacing is a bit too slow and the interaction of the characters themselves are remaining shallow. So when I compare it to Baldur's Gate or other games where there is de definitely deep banter, Jack the Lions 3, solid banter within uh, the, the group, this is not happening to the same degree in this game. So good, but not exceptional. All right, so moving on to category number two, which is graphics and GUI. The graphics and GUIs of the game are good. They are using modern engine, fully 3D animated uh, models. The animations look uh, fine and fluently. I'll show some gameplay in a second, but I also want to show the limits of what uh, we are seeing. So uh, the game has chosen a comic -y, um uh, appeal, which is fine. I personally don't mind it. Uh, that gives you the option to really hide a couple of uh, the shortcomings and you don't need to go into photorealistic graphical performance. However, when you do that, I would expect that the polygons and the textures are on point. And this is where the game has a few shortcomings. I give you the example of this right hand side of uh, the main screen where you are uh, seeing that the polygons here are just really not well done. Um, they the the texture itself looks um, yeah not as if someone has put enough attention to detail into it. The agents themselves and just the artwork is fine. I would say that's on par. And also the animations of uh, the agents are okay. But you can see the little clipping here, the photoshopping. Uh, it's not really done in a fully professional way. There are easy ways other than uh, using the uh, pre-existing blooming effects of uh, the uh, engines uh, in order to give a little bit more lively uh, fashion. It's 2023, so I need to compare the graphics towards modern standards. And this is a bit, this is already ultra mode and it's not really on par uh, with other modern games. Which brings us to the second part of the graphic and GUI category, which is the graphical user interface. And whilst the graphic is not outstanding and actually a bit sloppy at times, you can see that the GUI has uh, had its fair share of development. It is clean, it is on point. Uh, you can see a lot of information is displayed. In this case, not only the goals, but also where agents have been spotted out. Uh, impact of AOEs, uh, clear line of sight, uh, the uh, uh, direction that all of the enemies can see, their detection radius as well as their alert status. So a lot of information is being uh, displayed in a really concise fashion. All of the skills in the game are fully explained, albeit uh, the game could do a bit of a better job explaining status effects, so you really need to know what uh, you're uh, doing. It's not very uh, friendly for newcomers, but you kind of get the hang uh, of it. Uh, the random uh, chances are being properly explained. So there is a, a good breakdown of each of uh, the hit chances, uh, for instance, as well as um, the, the limits of your abilities. When I played the game, it took me just moments to understand what is happening. The game does a phenomenal job in hand-holding you through the adventure and the graphical user interface is a good example of how modern tactical games should work. Uh, the game itself uh, works on a grid system just like XCOM 
and it feels very lively when you're playing it. A, the, the combat is where the game shines. So this brings me to the graphical and GUI rating of good, but not outstanding. I would say the graphic itself is more a five out of 10, kind of middle of the pack, to be honest. Uh, whilst the GUI itself is more of a very well uh, done GUI or even an exceptionally well done GUI. So the joint rating of that would be seven out of 10. Which nicely brings us to the category of sound and FX. The sound and FX of the game are good. Uh, whether it is the sounds of purchasing something, the little swooping sound when you're uh, changing a chapter or zooming into a mission, or simply the fact that all of uh, the interactions uh, with the agents are being fully voiced. So the dialogue feels uh, real, feels uh, very believable. This, uh, the story and the voice acting is done on point and the fighting sounds during the actual gameplay are also good. I can really imagine the pistols as well as the slapping sounds. At points, they might be a little bit over the top and feel cartoony, but it uh, suits the style of the game. What could have been done better is the music is a little bit on the lower end of the side, doesn't really inspire me in any particular form. Other games have done better music. It's a very calm and kind of classical uh, background. And on the FX side, I think a lot of uh, the interaction, the banter, could have been better between uh, the characters. So whilst other games suffer from using the same lines over and over, like Aliens of Dar uh, Aliens Dark Descent, this game suffers from actually not enough interaction of the characters. And I think the part of it has to do with the budget uh, cuts and having so many characters in there. Whilst I appreciate that you can speak with everybody in the hideout, it gets a bit dull in the actual game and also the enemies don't really feel like they're adding a lot uh, to it. Uh, whether you use a Bradford or a narrator in the darkest dungeon, from a sound perspective, you can do more in order to push uh, the game forward. As such, sound and FX are good, but not exceptional and certainly not genre defining for Lamplighters Leak. Which brings us to the tactical gameplay and that is where Lamplighters Leak is really truly shining. It is one of the best tactical games that I've played in a while. The design and effort has truly and focused around the tactical side of the game. It reuses concepts of other games um, I'm not the biggest uh, hater of reusing good ideas. Um, some of it looks a bit like a cheaper ripoff, for instance, um, just blatantly using three chosen like characters um, or using a kind of environmental effects that really look a bit like Divinity Original Sins 2. Uh, that generally is uh, fine using the typical now uh, established two action point system and then a very cooldown heavy um, combat system uh, combined with a few skills per, per character which remind you um, of gears tactics in a sense so when you already hear all of uh, these kind of games that it drew inspiration of to use a positive phrasing you can see that the editors of the game have have uh, spent quite a bit of time to think about a fun and interactive way of playing the game on a tactical layer. And the result really shows. So when I played the game, I got hooked very, very uh, fast. The idea of having an ultimate ability, having certain cooldown related abilities, being able to skill deeper into your agents, having a less uh, dread, uh, dreadful consequences for losing hit points uh, with the down state, but also a diverse cast of enemies makes uh, the actual combat gameplay refreshing and fun. It tries to borrow uh, from elements of other games where there is a setup period uh, with indi indicating additional skills that can only be used out of combat. Whilst I appreciate those, I think um, they wouldn't have been necessary in order to make it a good game. So 
why would I give this game a very good uh, rating or almost an exceptional rating? Because it does uh, all of the things that other games do equally well and tries to combine it into one game. Why is it not genre defining or kind of a year a game of the year uh, type of uh, gameplay? There are still a couple of things that could have been done better. The few agents that I've uh, seen do have interesting uh, core abilities, but those uh, core abilities do not necessarily feel fully balanced. Uh, while some of the agents uh, are, in my perspective, already uh, objectively stronger, other agents have taken a bit the short end of the stick. For a freshly released game with enough time to balance, I would have expected more emphasis on balancing. The second uh, portion is the game heavily relies on you choosing agents and having then a, a concrete kit. And the quote unquote customization is the so-called deck of many hands where you get additional abilities uh, that you can then use on top of your normal abilities. Whilst that is a cute little system, it doesn't really allow you for deep character customization for a paradox game. I am surprised to see um, the lack of uh, tactical depth compared to other games uh, the Paradox normally releases. It's not a major uh, deficiency, but if I compare this, for instance, to a Battletech or uh, this here uh, to a uh, Jagged Alliance 3, then I wouldn't say that the game is outstanding to either of them. It's maybe a fair competitor on the gameplay, but definitely not superior. And it would need to be in order to be a better game and kind of a game of the year. So that's how I would balance uh, the judgment compared to other games. I think uh, the game could have benefited from more time in the actual testing of uh, the, the game and more balancing as well as a bit deeper character customization. Clearly appreciate that all of that takes more development time and makes the game more, diffi uh, more difficult uh, to release. But as it stands, it is a rather light-hearted uh, tactical game. And if you're expecting deep combinations uh, that uh, the world has never seen before, then you might be in uh, for a surprise as the game d definitely doesn't deliver that tactical depth in terms of combat. Um, however, uh, altogether, I would uh, give the uh, gameplay a very good, um, which would bring it solidly into the 8 out of 10 category. Let's finally talk about replayability. So replayability within games, specifically single player games, is always a bigger concern. Uh, many of the companies therefore try to opt for different decision path. Lamplighter does that. Uh, you have the decision between various missions and various missions therefore also unlock at least in the order different of uh, different agents. You also do have a certain amount of freedom in the actual skill trees that you can see here. Uh, each of the skills slightly increase a different focal point of the game. On top of that, there is some uh, sort of variance in there with the so-called deck of undrawn hands. So as you go through the game, you will get these random skills that sometimes slow, sometimes uh, just uh, stall enemies, sometimes it's a ranged skill, sometimes it's a melee skill, sometimes it's a passive skill. It essentially changes the way that the character behaves to make it a little bit different. So those are the methods of deployed by the game in order to increase the replayability. But fundamentally, there are a couple of uh, difficulties with replayability in Lamplighter's League. For starters, you do have static um, level design. There is no dynamic level design. I know that that always uh, takes a lot of effort in order to implement it. But when we talk about kind of the 10 out of 10 in terms of replayability XCOM 2, then you need to compare a game of that genre. This is uh, kind of the benchmark of when you want to be at the very top in terms of replayability. 
Lamplighter Sneak is not there. The level design is an example of that. Uh, the characters themselves do not have enough uh, differences in skill trees. If you think about the long wars of uh, these uh, world or even Gears Tactics, who does have uh, a very deep character development uh, tree, Jagged Alliance 3 is a good example of that. Here the characters are flatter in their design and the mechanics are easier to grasp. It's more casual in nature and with that, which is funny to say because Paradox typically is known for the exact opposite, but with uh, the flatter, uh, more streamlined version, it might appeal to a broader audience, but I think the core idea of the game was sell it once, uh, enjoy the storyline once, have a great cinematic experience, streamline it, have a couple of cool characters, but replayability really hasn't been uh, the main concern. As such, I would give it an middle of the pack, maybe with slight heads of uh, Im improvement uh, out there, so 6 out of uh, 10 type of replayability. Which then really brings us to the summary of the review. So where do we stand with Lamplighter's League? Totally, I would give the game a 7 out of 10, which is a good plus game. Not a great uh, game, but a definitely solid game. The game has potential specifically with its tactical gameplay system to be more than that. I think uh, the game, however, was designed as a lighthearted, uh, short uh, term one playthrough distraction and that there is nothing wrong with that in the inherent uh, design. I personally think that Lamplighter Sneak is a great game. It is worth your money if you're looking for a tactical game in the 1920s. If you like the uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen um, or the uh, Call of Cthulhu theme, then all of uh, that could be something that is very close to the magical inspired 1920s setup of the Lamplighter Sneak. I liked it, I enjoyed the game, and the game is good for what it is trying to do. I actually would give it a very good 7 out of 10 is exactly that. So that's where we stand. Uh, let me know what you think about the review. Have I nailed it? Are you of a different opinion? Please leave comments down below and let me know what you think of Lamplighter's League. Take care and have a good one as always. Bye bye.